Um, quite a number of you know me, of course, and, um, and uh, you know, we, we go back a long way, some of us, um, and others of you may not know, have a clue who I am, but Vanessa and I are pastors down at Seacoast Church in Ballina, and um, part of our heart is definitely planted right here at Arise, because um, Arise was birthed out of Seacoast, uh, even before we knew who the pastors were going to be, or we just felt God say, come to Lismore, re-establish the church um, up there. So our heart is definitely here. And so I want to thank you for having us um, again this morning. Um, you know, this morning, the songs, what Daniel's been speaking, just uh, speak right into um, what I want to share this morning, because I, I really want, my hope is this morning that I, that I would speak life and faith into your lives today. Does that sound good? Uh, because I think every one of us has been, uh, you know, a bit battered around um, by COVID over these last couple of years. And, you know, where our, our natural tendency may be to want to, to withdraw and to pull back. And, you know, I heard someone say this week, it's like people are hunkering down. And it kind of feels like that. And there's a tendency to want to do that. But I believe God is saying it's time actually to step up uh, and to step into his promises for our lives and for our future. Um, God's definitely not hunkering down. When the natural circumstances speak, withdraw, um, hide away, shut down, God says, be strong and of good courage and take possession of all that he has given us. Not just for our sake, but for the sake of the world we live in. The pattern in the Word of God reveals that when God's people find themselves you know, in a place where they are constrained or where they are in exile, um, that, um, you know, in, that, in that place, he actually calls them out um, to rise up and to take possession of the land that is rightly, rightly, rightfully theirs. Now, you know, I'm talking about COVID. I'm not saying we don't follow health advice. Of course we do. What I'm saying is God is not restrained by a virus. He hasn't changed one bit, and neither has his plan to bring salvation to the world. I'm going to be bringing some scriptures this morning um, about the land, uh, because land was a big part of God's promise, his provision for his people in the Old Testament times. But our land... Maybe, maybe different for each one of us. Um, it's what the land represents to us. And it's most likely not necessarily f physical land that I'm really talking about this morning or God's talking about. Uh, it might be. But it's more likely to be really that place where you belong in life and where you belong in the kingdom. He's calling us to our true identity and our destiny and that's what, that's what he really wants us ultimately to possess. For Israel, their identity and their destiny was very much tied up with their land, and still is. Um, but what is it for us here in Australia in, in 2022? What does that mean? So as I talk about the land this morning, broaden your thinking um, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about your own life. Right from the beginning, you know, in the Garden of Eden through to the final chapters of Revelation where it talks about um, the New Jerusalem, it's talking about the places that, that have been given to us as our, as our realm of belonging, our possession and our inheritance. And we're going to see that, that land and belonging are both a divine and gracious gift from God, but also incredible responsibilities. Now, us Westerners, um, you know, rightly or wrongly, uh, it's often about ownership of land. Sometimes, you know, it's a lifelong pursuit to own your very own block of land, especially when, it, of course, it comes with a house on it. And as I thought about the, the different cultures and even different spiritual beliefs, I realised that land speaks a powerful message. And it isn't about necessarily owning the land individually. In fact, you know, I really thought about this. Do we, do we ever really own the land that, that God has created and given for every generation? Look at our own indigenous people. The land is intrinsically entwined into their culture and into their spirituality. Their identity themselves is, is with the land 
that they came from and, and that they belong to. And it's part of who, who they are. For them, land speaks of identity, but they don't necessarily own it. And I was also listening this week to what seemed like, um, you know, at first just like a simple Irish, uh, Scottish love song. And I will confess, I was watching the movie Wild Mountain Time. Anybody seen that movie? You have to watch Wild Mountain Time. It's Time, T-H-Y-M-E. Great movie. And it's, it's safe <laughs> to watch. Um, but the theme song in this movie, it's like a romantic uh, love song. And at first you would think it was talking about a, a couple. Uh, but I realised that it wasn't really speaking about love between a couple at all. It's actually talking about love for the land, the mountains, the meadows, the flowers. And so, you know, what I'm trying to say is that it seems like there's something inherently deep within all of us, all around the world, whether we recognise it or not, that looks to the land as being vitally important part of who we are. And in our cultural, in different cultural songs and in, in culture, in spirit, spirituality, the land is, is deeply important. I want to take us to the book of Ezekiel this morning, because this prophet of God says, has some things to say to us thousands of years later uh, from, from when they were first spoken. And towards the end of this chapter of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel proclaims the incredible promise that God has given us a new heart and placed a new spirit within us. And uh, we believe that, of course, with all our heart. Um, and it's, 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 um, but it's also part of our call to the new land that we live in, the new place of belonging, our identity and destiny. But the interesting thing is that this chapter begins with God speaking prophetically to the land itself. He's actually speaking to the mountains of Israel. And uh, these mountains at that time had been uh, taken over by uh, enemy nations. There's a few verses here, but I want you to listen to this. In um, verse 36, 1 to 5, and says, And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel, and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has said, of you, aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, because they made you desolate, talking to, the, talking to the land and the mountains, because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and you are taken up by the lips of talkers and slandered by their people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord to the mountains, to the hills, to the uh, rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, and to the cities that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Lord God, surely I have spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all of Edom, who, be, who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds in order to plunder its open country." You can hear God's anger and his indignation and what he calls his burning jealousy here. Um, the land has been desecrated. It's been plundered and overtaken by God's enemies, by idol worshippers. And they have taken possession of the land that, that actually was set apart for God's people and for God's purposes. But God was having none of it. This land that, that we live in right now has been overtaken by something right now that, that just wants to shut us down and to keep us captive. Physically, emotionally, mentally, even socially and, and spiritually. It's, it's a very different enemy to the one that um, plundered Israel, but an enemy all the same. But, da, but God, doesn't, um, God doesn't speak captivity, he speaks possession. So in, in verse 8, it goes on and says, But you, O mountains of Israel, still talking to the land here. He's not talking to the people. He's talking to the land. You, O mountains of Israel, you shall shout forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. 
I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, I will, I will cause men to, um, to walk on you, my people Israel. They shall take possession of you, and you shall be their inheritance. No more shall you bereave them of children. When I was reading this, my heart was actually breaking. Um, you know, no more shall you bereave them of children. He's speaking to the land, and he's speaking to an inheritance of blessing. I believe we are called to prophesy over the land. Not just the people, not just communities, but the land. We have been called to such a time as this, to a land such as this. And this is our time, and this is our land. You know, this church, Arise Church, is part of our inheritance. And this is, you know, this land that we're on, of course, is part of in Indigenous land, but it's our land as well. Just let me clarify one thing to here too. As I, I'm speaking about Israel, I just want to say we are not Israel. We haven't replaced Israel. We are Gentiles who, by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ our Saviour, have been grafted in um, to become God's people as well. But we have our own land to possess. There are principles of Israel's history and, um, and, and principles of the Word of God that we can glean from these stories for ourselves because this is our word as well. This is the word of God for us in this time and it speaks into our generation. And today God is speaking to us about the land in which we dwell. And I had this thought, what does this repetitive cycle of God's people going in, you know, possessing the land, then finding themselves in exile on repeat time and time again, what does this speak to us about our own lives? It happened with Adam and Eve. God gave Adam and Eve the most beautiful, fruitful, rich land in which to dwell. But it was more, more than just land. It was the place where they met with God, you know, to be with him in the cool of the evening. They had this open, transparent, totally loving, caring, intimate relationship with God as they dwelt in and possessed the land that he had given them. So when we speak of the land, we, we speak of all that it means in relation to God. It speaks to our identity as sons of God. It speaks to our relationship with him as father. And it was a, a relationship of trust and obedience that, that Adam and Eve had. But what happened? You know, through being deceived by Satan and consequently being disobedient, um, that place was broken. That world became the world became a fallen place. And Adam and Eve found themselves banished from that garden. Um, and they were now in exile with, with, um, you know, with the garden's entrance being guarded by angels. They couldn't get back in. They were exiled from that place of belonging. And it was tragic. It, it would influence the world, the whole world, throughout every generation. And it became the cause. Um, it, would, it would cause the land then uh, and the whole earth to, to begin to groan and to cry out for healing and restoration. And for the sons of God, the sons of God, to be revealed, the word says. Then, of course, later on, uh, Israel was exiled for over 400 years in Egypt. Even when they were delivered from Egypt and they, you know, they wandered as a people in the wilderness, in the desert, um, the only generation... It was only the generation that was born while they were in the wilderness that were actually able to then enter eventually into the promised land. And I love where God speaks to Joshua and the people of Israel and he says this in Joshua 1.3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread, tread upon, I have given you. Every place where you put your foot, I have given you. This was their inheritance. The land was already their possession but they had to step out and place their feet on the land. They had to start the process, uh, sorry, had to start to possess, possess the land again through their own actions, through their heart, you know, response, and through faith and trusting God himself. 
sometimes in the kingdom of God, by, you know, you, you, we have to possess by faith what is already ours. Where do you need to place your foot right now? I ask you these questions, but I'm, I ask myself the same. Where do we place our foot? I remember way back, I don't know how many years ago, five, six, seven years ago, when we came up here um, to Lismore, to Ganelabar, it's like God was saying, place your foot there. Just place your foot there and take possession of what is already yours. But I'm, I'm you know, what does it mean for you to possess by faith what is already yours? And I'm talking about not just physical land. I'm talking about dreams and visions, relationships, callings and careers, you know, stepping through barriers of fear and intimidation. Your land could be anything like, you know, like this that needs you to possess it, to step in and to take it by faith. Don't be like Israel and let unbelief and the lies of the devil hold you back from your rightful possession. There are many people that struggle with these challenges, you know, today. Is God, is God really a good God? Can he be trusted? Some Christians are still not convinced. Where do you belong? Where do you belong, really, as a child of God in this world? Well, wherever it is, take possession of it. Start doing it by faith, through prayer to begin with. You know, we've, I don't know if you guys have heard about um, this season of prayer and fasting. Uh, INC in January usually have this period of prayer and fasting where we just pray for the coming year. Um, now is an ideal time at the beginning of the year to, to really pray and say, God, what is it you want me to possess uh, this year? So then there's the time the, uh, when Israel lost its way again. Again, through disobedience and unbelief, they found themselves in exile in Babylon for, uh, for 70 years. Uh, they, had, you know, they began to worship idols. They were influenced spiritually and culturally by the, the world, the nations around them. And they took their eyes off the one true God. And so God's judgment actually came in the form of exile in Babylon. And they were, were removed from their own land and became prisoners and slaves to a, a foreign kingdom. But again, in God's faithfulness, God honoured his covenant with Israel, um, that he was their God. And he raised up leaders, spiritual leaders, uh, governmental leaders, and led the people to rebuild and restore and possess the land again. And finally now, in the New Testament times, um, we see the Jewish people scattered again, even now. It, it began again in, in um, AD 70, 70 AD. The people ultimately then, since then, uh, have been scattered all around the world. Persecution, wars, everything in between has caused Israel to be exiled in every other nation of the world. But even at this very moment, there's a turn again. An increasing number of Jewish people are returning to the land that is theirs. Multitudes of them. I actually read, you know, in spite of the, what's going on with the pandemic around the world, last year there, were, there was a 30% increase in um, Jewish people returning to the land of Israel. And this is, includes a majority of young families, young families, children, returning to their land. It's an exciting time. You know, there's something about Israel coming back to their own land. It means a lot to them, but you know what? I can tell you it means a lot to us as well. We are not only tied up with Israel's history, we are also tied up with Israel's future and her destiny. <clears throat> By the grace of God, we have the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that was prophesied by all, by all the Old uh, Testament prophets. And, and we have entered into a new covenant, a covenant purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, where law doesn't determine our place of belonging, but love does. Love does. Um, and, uh, you know, the love of God and Israel's eyes are being opened and being opened more and more as, as in these last days. So just as I move towards the end of my message, I've just got a few points I want to share with you. Um, regarding all of this, a few themes that come up in this whole story. Firstly, we possess the land by faith. 
We are to be people of faith. Um, whether, whether we literally own land or not, we are to have the same faith and trust in God that Israel had. But it's even more than that. And as I said, it's about possessing whatever it is that God has already given us. In Hebrews 11.6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, unbelief, unbelief will keep you um, constrained and, um, and, and in exile. It will keep you in a cycle of possession and exile, possession and exile. And, you know, all of us, I think, have been on that journey in our lives um, and find ourselves in both of those places. You know, God might have given you your land, whatever your land looks like, but unless you possess it with a complete heart of faith and trust, you will not be able to truly enter into your inheritance as your reward, as that scripture says in Hebrews. Secondly, another thing that caused Israel to be in exile was disobedience. Disobedience is deliberately choosing to say no to God and to follow your own path. You know what? That's a really scary place to be. Jesus says in John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And so obedience comes through knowing the spirit and knowing the word. Not just knowing, but obeying. You know, I have seen over the course of our time in ministry, which is now, you know, including in Brisbane, it's probably 26 years, I have seen too many Christians fall because they project their own judgments and own opinions upon their choices and decisions. They declare that, that God is a God of love, which of course he is, but they fall short of what Jesus says the love is. Because in John 14, 15, Jesus himself says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So love and obedience go together. What a deception it is to think that we can get away with a sinful lifestyle because God is a God of love. Thirdly, in Hebrews, it speaks of entering the promised land and it speaks at also at the same time of entering God's rest. In Hebrews 4.1, it says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. You know, if we fall short of stepping into the land or that place in life that God has for us, if we choose not to place our foot into God's promises for us by faith, not for Israel, but for us, then we will also fall short of entering our rest. Our land is our place of belonging. It will always be too at the feet of Jesus, knowing him as Lord and Saviour, knowing that he has broken every chain, which we sang about this morning, freed us from the burden of law and works. The works were finished at the cross. There's no amount of works that, you can, that can save you or free you. In Christ, you are free. Yes, we are called then to, to good works and to express our faith in God, but we don't do it from a place of earning our salvation. His burden is light. His yoke is easy. Entering your land is entering your rest. And doesn't this land of Australia need a revelation of true rest in Jesus Christ? Lastly, possessing your land doesn't mean there are no battles to fight. But we can stay in that place of peace and rest on the inside because God says, these battles are mine. I will fight for you, just be strong and of good courage. When the spies returned that time from checking out Israel's promised land, they brought back magnificent um, fruit from that land, you know, they carried it on their, on their back and on poles and, you know, these grapes that were massive and, um, and, and, and the people realised, you know, they could see it's true. This promised land that we're called to possess, it's, it's true, God was right. But with the new land came the prospect of having to overcome some giants. There would be some battles 
to fight. But only Joshua and Caleb could see the big picture. In Numbers 13.30, it says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. What does your land look like? Hasn't God already revealed his goodness and faithfulness to you? Daniel was praying that this morning. Not exactly those words, but he was saying, God, you've been so faithful. And he has. He's shown us the magnificent fruit of his kingdom and, and, you know, the fruit of faithfulness. You've seen it with your own eyes. Did he promise there'd be no battle? No, he didn't. But he did promise you a glorious and fruitful land. Whatever battles you face, he promises to be with you, to fight for you, to see you overcome. We're not the first to walk this road. David said in Psalm 27, he said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God is calling us into the land of the living. Not the dead, not the defeated, not the overcome, and definitely not the withdrawn and the shut down and the isolated and the defeated because of COVID-19. He calls overcomers. Overcomers usually are called that because they have stuff to overcome. If you haven't done it already, put your foot in the land. Commit yourself to walk on your land the land that has already been possessed for you. Let's, take, let's possess those things in life that are already our possession. Amen?